Welcome to Healing at the Speed of Light. Every week, we discuss how laser therapy is changing healthcare and how you can benefit. Now, here is your host and founder of Laser Therapy Institute, Dr. Jason Roundtree. Good to see you. Good Happy to see you New too. Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, we're back in action after the holiday break. Yeah. So, it's good to be back here diving into some research, talking mm-hmm. about not just laser therapy and light therapies, but generally kind of cutting edge therapies and what are we doing with healthcare mm-hmm. uh, as a society and, and where does laser fit and how can you make wise choices for your own health as a patient. Nice. So um, we've been talking about low back stuff a lot mm-hmm. lately and I, I don't want to just keep banging on the same drum but at the same time low back pain is a big deal. Most people are going to have it. Mm-hmm. Um, most people are going to end up seeking care for it of some kind, and a lot of people do end up getting surgery for it. Well, and it seems to stem to cause other issues. If you don't address your low back pain and get that taken care of, it can just manifest in so many other ways. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's kind of the um, well, it's the backbone, right? I mean, everything mm-hmm. really comes from the back when it comes to stability if you have back problems you can't walk normally or lift normally and so it has large effects on your day-to-day movements and your activities of daily living but also work socialization right yeah so it's it's painful it's painful (laughs) it is so uh, i wanted to get into some of that today before we get into the content that we have i should do an introduction this is christy Hello. Christy is a certified laser tech. She's been with LTI for a long time now, since the beginning. Since the beginning. Yep. Christy, it's been great. It, it has been. I'm so glad we've had you here. Uh, Christy does a lot of our, uh, really pretty much all of the development work for our online courses for doctors. But she's also pretty smart with everything else too, and she's a great person to have here with me for these podcasts. And my name is Dr. Jason Roundtree. I'm a certified medical laser safety officer and a chiropractor, and I am the founder of Laser Therapy Institute. We are a network of laser therapy pros across the U.S. You can find a clinic near you by going to Mm lasertherapyinstitute.org. If you are looking for effective light and laser therapies, you're not going to find anybody better out there than an LTI clinic. Um, But let's talk about why you might want to find laser therapy for a back problem, and we'll get there by kind of talking about first, failed back surgeries. Mm. Failed back surgeries. So, um, patients have a lot of different perspectives on on back surgery, surgery in general. A lot of people do want to avoid surgery just because Mm -hmm. they know that things can sometimes not go very well. Right. Um, But a lot of people, I would probably say the majority of people view surgery as like a light switch. Oh, I'm just going to go turn off this pain by having surgery. Well, they don't think of the recuperation time and the healing and the rehabilitation and all that. There is a domino effect with any kind of surgery. Yeah, even with a successful surgery. Mm -hmm. You've got your prep time, your your downtime where you can't necessarily do things. Right. Um, You know, a lot of times there's medications to go along with that. And so it's a it's a it's a big change to your day to day routine, mm-hmm. and that's just assuming that you get perfect results out of a surgery, you know. So there there are things that should be considered, right. um, and so I found this study uh, a while ago, and I've been meaning to get to it, but this is one of the few studies out there that really looks at something called failed back surgery syndrome. Um, and I think it helps us kind of look at when surgery goes well and when it doesn't. How often can we expect surgeries to not go well, really? And Because that should factor into your decision making. Mm-hmm. Unlike many other things, once you have surgery, you can't go back. You can't take it back. You can't right. just go, oh, well, I'll just get another surgery. A lot of times that's not an option. Right. So when you hear failed back surgery syndrome, what, what do you think that might encompass? That well, one I guess I go to the extreme that anything to do with the back could end up with some sort of paralysis. You know, I don't know that that is a logical step or conclusion, but anything with the back, it's it's crucial mm-hmm. because it is so. I mean, just like your core is important, your back is the backbone. I mean, right. it's, it's who it's what stabilizes you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, in an extreme case, yeah, you can definitely have nerve damage. With the low back, you're you're very unlikely to have really paralysis because the spinal cord actually ends a little higher than the low back. Um, but you can have some really significant nerve effects for sure, and you can lose uh, muscular function. Um, you can have nerve pain, certainly. Mm -hmm. And so when they say failed back surgery syndrome, what they are kind of categorizing that as is just really two simple things. One is people that experience residual symptoms like chronic back pain or leg pain or numbness after one or more surgeries and dissatisfaction with their results. Okay. I think this is kind of interesting actually because it's not just a strict definition of paralysis or pain. It is also the patient's perception. And I think that is overlooked a lot of times when we start looking at success and failure rates. You know, are the patients actually happy with what they got? Well, and that's a, a very valid point because perception is according to each person. Yes. I mean, you can have definite results, but if the patient is not seeing that or even wanting to believe it, it's not going to make any difference because that's their perception. Right. So. Yep. So I think this is pretty nice, uh, and I, I would like to see more syndromes uh, include patient perception because mm -hmm. if you've got a patient who is basically hopeless, their success rates for really just about anything are going to be lower. You know, if they're convinced that nothing's going to help that pain or it's, it's been there forever, and we see this all the time in practice. You know, a patient comes in, they want to get care for their shoulder. You ask them what else is going on. Oh, I've had back pain for 20 years. Okay, well, should we take a look at that? No, nothing's ever going to help that. Literally just had one of those, I think it was yesterday or the day before, you know. Um, so that's where we go, well, hold on, let's, let's really look at it. Let's really consider something here. But, but yeah, in a lot of cases, those people have already given up. There's so much about the mind that matters. Yes. So. Yes, absolutely. So kind of a unique, unique uh, definition, failed back surgery syndrome, people with residual symptoms like pain or numbness. Um, after surgeries and then a complaint of dissatisfaction um, due to those surgery or due to those um, those residual symptoms after surgery that, that's kind of how we define it so today's study uh, it was actually published in 2017 in the journal of pain research and it's titled prevalence characteristics and burden of failed back surgery syndrome the influence of various residual symptoms on patient satisfaction and quality of life as assessed by a nationwide internet survey in Japan. Those titles are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a long one. It's a long it's, title. It's quite lengthy. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, it's, yeah. Basically, Japanese, uh, or this based in Japan, looking at people who still had ongoing problems uh, specifically after low back surgeries mm -hmm. um yeah quite lengthy you know that scene from the office where michael's reading off a title of what he wants on the paper and it's just on and on and on and on and on and on yeah that's what this kind of feels like reading it yeah i don't have to say it again though so uh <laughs> but looking at that you know uh, they wanted to know uh several things they wanted to estimate the prevalence of failed back surgery syndrome based on both residual symptoms and patient perspectives as we just said they also wanted to, to determine the characteristics of residual symptoms such as low back pain, dull ache, numbness, and cold sensations after lumbar spine surgery. And then third, they wanted to evaluate the negative impact of such residual symptoms on patient satisfaction with the surgery, the health-related quality of life, and mental health. So a pretty thorough look at what's going on with back surgeries and specifically failed back surgeries. So they took, and they, this was just an internet survey. And they surveyed like a million people. <laughs> but out of those million people, they only got about 1,800 mm -hmm. that really qualified for and answered the study, answered this questionnaire in a way that they thought it was probably valid data. So the really big wide funnel really came down to just, um, you know, a, a quite a bit smaller handful of people. But still, 1,800 people is a pretty, large amount mm -hmm. you know for people that um, aren't talking about had surgery maybe had symptoms maybe didn't because the, the questionnaire was for patients not only that felt good about their surgery but just generally people who had had surgery within the last five years 
So it wasn't targeting failed surgeries. It was just surgery in general and, and the results. Right. Okay. Yep, exactly. They were trying to get a balanced look at, okay, which, you know, how, what percentage of surgeries in the low back do end up failing versus success, and what does that failure really look like? Okay. So they came away with the conclusion after all after looking at all the data that 21.6% of all surgical patients end up as failed back surgery syndromes. Hmm. That's a that's a pretty large amount. Yeah. Let's look at the the positive side of that though. I mean 78ish percent were, you know, basically successful at least as far as the patients felt they had good success. Um, so that's good. That's a good number. But still, you've got 21, a little more than 21% of people coming away going, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm not in good shape. That, that's just alarming, really. When, yeah. yeah. When we're talking about surgeries, yes. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about maybe a, a trigger point injection, you know, into the muscle or mm -hmm. some laser therapy or physical therapy, you know, if 21% if of those people fail or, or don't do well, I mean, you go on to kind of the next solution. Right. And those things are non-invasive, or surgery is very invasive. Yes. So. Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, there's definitely some positive. A, a lot of back surgeries are satisfactory, do go well, but certainly worth keeping in mind that a pretty good chunk of them don't go well. Yeah. Let's break that down a little bit more here. They say that failed back surgery syndrome was more likely to occur in individuals who are older than 65 and was more frequent in those who had had a spinal fusion and with those who had undergone multiple operations. Interesting. I'm just, my mind is going mm -hmm. as to why that could be. Well, you know, age yep. and age. Um, the inability or the slower ability to heal or mm -hmm. recuperate from yep. something invasive. Yes. Um, just are not able to get around and function as well. I don't right. know if that has any play into it. Probably. They, they don't really go into details, but we talked a little bit about this, I think, on our last episode here about aging. Mm -hmm. Age gives you the ability to acquire more and more damage. Right. And it slows down your body's metabolism mm -hmm. and ability to regenerate. And, and so and when you're over 65, it's pretty significant how much ability the body's lost. And for a lot of people, a lot of people, especially in the U.S., People have lost a lot of muscular ability, muscular tone, mm -hmm. you know, and strength overall, a lot of times coordination. And that means that recovering from a spine surgery is going to be more difficult mm -hmm. if you're detrained, if your cells are aged, if you've already accumulated more damage and other injuries. So that's, that's probably the big factor there. Again, that's not really lined out in, the or in, this, uh, in this report, but that, that's probably where it really ties in there. But the one that I really keyed in on is the fact that this happens more often in spinal fusions and those who have had more than one surgery. Yeah. So that is interesting. Fusions are really pretty disastrous. We, we know from research at this point that most fusions are not any better than skipping the surgery completely by the time you get to the five year outlook. Hmm. So when we're talking about fusing multiple levels of the spine, uh, you have a lot of ongoing problems with that and, and most of the time people don't end up being any better than the folks that skipped that fusion surgery. Well, you're still, it, fusion to me means you still cannot, you're not very mobile. And if you didn't have the surgery, you probably aren't very mobile because of the pain. Mm -hmm. So it, it, yeah. Yeah. Now, now, some people really do need fusion. Some people really do need surgery. So don't take anything that we're right. talking about today to say that, no. you know, you, you don't need a surgery. No. There are cases where you, you need a surgery. You have to have it. You know, red flag cases where you have loss of bowel or bladder control, where you have um, significant, especially sudden weakness and severe pain. Those cases can be. But let's keep in mind that here in the United States, we perform surgeries, low back surgeries, at a rate five times greater than other developed countries didn't know that uh-huh <clears throat> yeah i'm gonna actually pull this up from the harvard wow. study that we looked at a few episodes ago mm -hmm. uh 2020 study uh from harvard medical um yeah five times the rate of, of surgeries here in the u.s as compared to other developed countries is that just looking for some sort of solution mm, i don't know 
I gotta be careful what I say on that one. Yeah, I'm very I'm opinionated on it. No, 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 <laughs> it's a fair question. Um, now this study that we're talking about though mm-hmm. is in Japan. Mm-hmm. So let's keep that in mind as we're talking about this too. Right. They perform a lower rate of lumbar surgeries than we do here in the U.S. They don't need as many. Um, we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. But if they're looking at a 21% failure rate, mm-hmm. what are we looking at here in the U.S.? Is it? It's likely to be greater if we do more surgeries more often. You would think so. Probably. Mm-hmm. Don't have that data here, but probably. Okay. Uh, next one I wanted to bring up here, if I can find my data point. There we go. Um, sorry. There it is. Uh, breaking down this, this failed back surgery piece a little bit more. They say that low back pain and leg numbness disappeared completely in only 25% and 34% of patients, respectively. So a quarter of all patients who went into a surgery with low back pain got complete relief. That means 75% of people came out of a low back surgery with low back pain. Mm -hmm. That seems backwards. Yeah. Okay. And and that goes back to, we we need to rework this idea that surgery Mm -hmm. is just switch. We're we're just gonna turn off that pain. We're just gonna cut that painful item out. The back is very complex. It's Mm -hmm. not a simple hinge joint like the knee. You can just replace something. You know, it is, it is a complex construction that has a lot of biomechanics that are really important to the stability of the body overall. Like you mentioned early on, you know, the mm-hmm. spine is, is your foundation really for everything. Mm-hmm. And you can't just go in and cut out the thing that's painful and expect things to be better. It's right. just not that simple. And if you're, you know, if you're thinking that surgery is the simple answer, it might be for a quarter of people, but that's a very that's that's a very low rate of you know getting rid of your symptoms totally. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, odds are against you if you're looking at surgery to completely resolve your pain. Yeah. That's not very promising. No, it really isn't. It really so isn't. That would be another option. I don't want to paint like a, a super <laughs> negative picture here. I just this is this is interesting data, and I think yes. people are not always informed of things like this, or they don't stop and listen to maybe what the surgeon's saying, and they just have this misunderstanding that I'm gonna just have my pain fixed and I'll be perfect. Um, And some people do get some very good relief, but the majority of people do not get complete relief. And my mind again is just going strong, going in um, circles, but you know, you think about insurance and what's covered and surgery anyway how much money is spent and how much money is spent for failure yeah and then they have to try to do it again yeah and that actually increases your rate of having failed back surgery syndrome because once you down you're now you're in multiple surgeries now you're in that yeah cycle to break that pain down a little bit they say that 12.3 percent of these folks had severe residual pain there's nothing worse than severe pain. There's no right. h- higher rating. It's severe as the top. So, right. so twelve point three percent of people came out with still having severe back pain. Forty three percent of people had moderate pain, and thirty six percent of people had mild pain. Only seven point nine percent reported no pain in the low back. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So you can undergo surgeries and still have a very high likelihood of coming out, you know, more than 50% likelihood that you're going to come out with moderate to severe low back pain. Mm-hmm. And you wonder what they went in with. Was it severe mm-hmm. when they before they did right. the surgery or was it severe after the right. surgery? Yeah. And that is one thing we don't have broken down. What we mm-hmm. do have broken down, and this is, this is kind of neat, is we've got a graph um, – that shows people that had you know pain that worsened or improved versus disappeared or had no change um and i'm not going to put this up because it won't display very well but there is a significant portion of people here who had low back pain that did go away completely or improved so maybe they were severe pain now they're down to moderate pain that's an improvement that's an improvement holy cow you know i mean to still have moderate pain afterward Mm -hmm. 
it, that's that's something to consider for sure if you're looking at surgical intervention. Essentially, when you when you compile all this data, between nine and thirty six percent of everyone who had surgery came away with no change or worsened symptoms. Mm-hmm. Now that does mean the majority of people do get some improvement, right? Mm-hmm. But still, those aren't great odds when we're talking about an invasive procedure that carries risks that can have lifetime effects. And most people, when they are going in for surgery, they expect it to be better. Yes. I, mean, I would. That I would. Yeah. That, it just is a very logical thought in my mind. I'm going to have surgery to help this, right. this situation. Yeah. And then to come out the other side is... Not encouraging. Yeah, not not if you have no change or right. or worse symptoms. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know that's kind of a big spread, nine to thirty six percent, but you just want to ball, ball, ballpark that to about twenty percent. Again, we're back to about that twenty percent of people who are are not going to come out better. Are they're right. going to be worse or they're going to be the same? And now they've undergone this invasive procedure, which is is going to have effects on them for forever, mm-hmm. in a lot of cases. So what do we do about that? What do we what do we do about this whole situation? That was my next right? question. Yeah. Is, okay, so, so is there a solution? Is there something that can be done? One thing that these guys point out is they say that realistic expectations prior to surgery are likely to have an important impact on patient satisfaction. Because they say that some patients were not satisfied even after a symptom was greatly improved or even disappeared. You go in with back pain, you come out without back pain, you're still not happy. <laughs> well, how does that work, right? But we've seen that here too. Yes. In clinic, where we have mm-hmm. someone that comes in, they get the the sessions of treatment that have been prescribed, and at the end they go, "Yeah, pain's totally gone. I'm really unhappy with whatever aspect of it, you know." And that's very rare. Um, but you think, well, what is happening? And and right. setting expectations is important, no matter if it's a therapy mm-hmm. situation or or an actual surgical mm-hmm. situation. So. If you're a patient and you're talking about getting care, whether it's conservative care or surgical care, make sure you're getting really clear expectations from your provider. What what Mm -hmm. am I looking at here? Mm -hmm. You know, is the pain going to go away? Is my strength going to improve? What are we trying to accomplish? So that way, when you go through a procedure or a series of treatments, you can know what you're trying to expect. You can come away with satisfaction that you got what you were trying to get. Right. Um, They say that Effective patient provider communication can affect patient satisfaction and health outcomes, not just how good the surgeon is or how great the laser therapy is, but actually how well the patient and the provider communicate Mm -hmm. really has a big effect on whether or not that patient is satisfied. Mm -hmm. Um, That is something I will say that our LTI clinics do quite well as far as Mm -hmm. being able to communicate well and educate patients on what to expect and what is happening. Um, You know, not every clinic out there is like that. Some surgeons are great at that. Some surgeons are not great at that. So, um, you know, if you're stuck getting surgery, if you don't feel like you understand the process very well or you're not communicating well with your surgeon, maybe you should get a second opinion mm-hmm. and, and see if you can find somebody that you can communicate well with because it's going to increase your chances of success. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, last thing is to keep in mind that, again, we're talking about Japan versus the United States. And this Harvard study says, like I mentioned already, that here in the U.S., let me get to it because I want to read you the quote correctly. The rate of spine surgery in the United States is the highest in the world, approximately five times that of England or Scotland. This may be due to a lack of standardization of practice across countries, or the high surgical rates may be due to the fear of potentially missing a diagnosis um, regardless of the reason, mm-hmm. and, and they go on to say, you know, we need to be careful about what we're doing, basically. Mm-hmm. But clearly, if we're performing that many more surgeries, there's something going on, you know. It's not to say that U.S. medical care is five times better when it comes to spine care than Canada or five times better than England. Um, I would argue that we're, maybe we're even, but we're spending that much more money, that much more time, and cutting into that many more people there may be something more going on there. Yeah. You know, whether it is that fear of misdiagnosis or maybe there's a financial incentive. I don't know. I can't speak to that. Anyway. No. <laughs> um, 
So, so if you have to have surgery, you know, make sure you can get with somebody that you can communicate well with. That's good. However, this particular study I'm looking at now, this this Harvard study, is all of, again Harvard 2020 uh, published in Global Spine Journal. It's an analysis of the effect of lumbar disc herniation size on the success of non-operative treatment, and essentially they say that it is better to try conservative care before going into surgery. And that is because over 90% of disc herniations in the low back will resolve on their own, and that in non-emergent settings, managing lumbar disc herniations conservatively, meaning not with an operation, for several weeks before offering surgery appears to be prudent. In this particular study, only 8.7% of the patients that they were working on actually ended up requiring surgery after having conservative care. Well, the conservative care can take maybe a few weeks longer mm -hmm. or a month or or even longer. But you have to be patient with, with that. Whereas I think, you know, just based on what we've said, people think the surgery is just going to be an immediate fix where if you're patient with the conservative care, it can actually be better. Yeah. So... At and least like that's what up, we've seen. Yeah, that is. That mm -hmm. is. Like you wrote it before too. People kind of discount the the recovery period. Well, that's mm -hmm. after. That's mm -hmm. it's still time. Right. It's still time where you're limited, and you, you know you could be off work. Mm -hmm. You could be anyway. There's so many factors. That, yeah. That, that play into that. Yeah. So, anyway, I just thought it was a nice uh, kind of listing off of the risks mm -hmm. there again this is not to say that no one needs surgery right. this is not to say that good surgeons are not important absolutely some Definitely. people need it mm -hmm. um you know if there's any level of emergency a lot of times people have to get a back surgery and hopefully they're in that 25 percent of people who have complete relief right um however if if you are looking at surgery as an option if it's an elective procedure for you and you haven't tried effective conservative care like physical therapy chiropractic laser mm -hmm. therapy massage mm -hmm. acupuncture any of those things you really should take a step back and consider some of those options before you rush into a surgery that cannot be undone right. that has a high likelihood of leaving you with residual pain and in some cases even worsening how you are and that is something you just can't come back from you can't take that back you can't so if you have questions on this you can always message us, uh, email us directly if you want to, info at lasertherapyinstitute.org. Again, if you're looking for an effective laser therapy provider near you, you can go to our website as well. There's a tab there, it's called Our Clinics. You can look mm -hmm. at a map and see if someone is near you. And if you're having trouble finding a good laser therapy provider near you, uh, you can just message us again. Let us know where you're at. We'll try and help you find a good laser therapy provider. Right. And in the meantime, you are certainly welcome to check out our website for other resources too. There's a whole page on there for patients specifically. Uh, you can sign up for a mailing list. There's uh, extra information about research. And we are here to help providers perform more and better laser therapy, conservative laser therapy, mm -hmm. non-invasive, non-surgical lasers. Right. In the effort to help our society improve healthcare and give patients better and better outcomes. Thanks for joining us. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Subscribe to this weekly podcast for more great information. Find a certified laser therapy clinic near you at lasertherapyinstitute.org. If you're a healthcare provider, check out our practitioner-focused Laser Therapy Institute podcast. Thanks for listening.